Okay, so well, thank you everyone uh, for for coming to to this presentation today. Um, so uh, the the presentation that we're going to to be seeing today is called Integrating Latin American Art into Language uh, Teaching Curriculum, and I would like to introduce our our presenters uh, briefly. Uh, on the one hand, Victoria Hadbard is a senior lecturer uh, of Spanish at Boston University's Department of Romance Studies. Her interests lie in the com uh, communicative language teaching approach, approach, excuse me, teachings through technology, multiculturalism, and diversity in the classroom. Dr. Hackbard, uh, other areas of interest include 20th century Spanish literature, Spanish women authors, and contemporary Spanish cinema. On the other hand, on the other hand, we have Aslim Perdomo, who is a lecturer in Spanish uh, uh, as well as uh, in, in Boston University's Department of Romance Studies. She's dedicated to teaching foreign languages through the lens of social justice with a project-based communicative and thematic approach. Uh, her main goal is to uh, stimulate the students to build to build of knowledge through practical and culturally inclusive content. Um, so if uh, if you guys are ready, please uh, share your screen and, and we're gonna start with the, with the presentation. Yes, and yes. so we are going to start the presentation. Sorry, I think uh, we didn't go all the way to the top. Um, yes, so hello everyone. My name is Victoria Hackbar. And um, as uh, Jose introduced me, I uh, am a senior lecturer at Boston University, and we're here to talk to you about integrating Latin American art into the uh, language teaching curriculum, specifically Spanish. Um, and uh, we would like to start with a Mentimeter. I don't know if you guys maybe are familiar with this, but uh, first of all, I wanted to share with you a couple of images, and in this case, street signs. And um, these are all images that we assume when we encounter them in certain countries that they are universally understandable. Well, if you think again, if you come from another country, another continent, maybe you, it might not be as universally um, understandable. Uh, for example, the car with the bomb looking explosion um, or the the children playing, are they supposed to play? Are they not supposed to play? So uh, these are not um, that straightforward. So let's go to the Mentimeter. And uh, I have a question for you. Why use art in L2, second language? And uh, I'm gonna open the Mentimeter. And um, what I'd like to ask you is to go on your phones or on your mobile device or your tablet, to put in menti.com on your phones, on your browser, on your phones, menti.com. And then it's gonna ask you to put in a code. And the code is gonna be here on the very top, uh, 46223382. So on your mobile phone, uh, just open it in Safari and uh, menti.com in your browser. I'm going to do it too. And it's going to ask to enter a code, which is 46223382, and then submit. Mm. Mm. You can put in multiple words, whatever comes to mind. Mm. Great words. Mm -hmm. Oh, those are great ideas coming up. Oh, wow. We have connection and exposure, learning diversity, yes. Culture, to avoid translations, very good. 
society, culture coming up several times. Mm -hmm. Learning culture, yes. Learning a language. Mm -hmm. Context, very important, yes. Show places, connection. Very good, great responses. Mm -hmm. We've had 13 responses, sounds like um, everyone present uh, mm -hmm. has had a chance to put in a response, but we have a great variety of responses. So all have to do with, with, with culture and learning and avoiding translations and learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another slide for you, another question. How are images interpreted across different cultures? So here, here you have a chance to put in a short response as well. Um, and uh, so across different cultures, so the word culture came up several times, right? Mm -hmm. um, in our previous slide. So how can we interpret images across different cultures? What helps us? in that task. Mm -hmm. um, what, what resources do we recur to in our minds and in, in our, right? So how can we interpret them across different cultures? What do we need? What, do, what abilities, what skills, right? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I see some responses coming in. Okay. Okay, uh, we already see that the interpretations can be very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see some uh, more responses. As you see, these are shorter, uh, shorter sentence uh, responses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we see that uh, images can be very different, interpreted very differently. For example, police symbols in Japan versus the West, a horn referring to the male. Yeah, very, yeah, those were images. Uh, for example, street signs that we've seen, excellent. Uh, depends on context and maybe beliefs, very good, like background information, what people draw on, right, from their background information, background knowledge. Uh, we have very differently, misinterpretation of images can be dangerous, mm -hmm. right? In one culture, an image can be a compliment. The same image can be an insult in another cu culture. So yes, be careful <laughs> with interpreting images, right? Uh, there are social, so sociological, and historical factors that impact visual literacy. Oh yes, great responses. Uh, different meaning, different symbolism. Yes, symbolism, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, symbols, as we connect symbols to culture and our beliefs. Uh, maybe specific motives have specific meanings. Who is interpreting? Who is the audience? Uh, that, those are great responses. I love all the keywords that are popping up, uh, such as symbolism and sociological, social, historical factors. Uh, misinterpretations can be dangerous, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And always taking into account your audience. Yes. So yes. So those are those are all or uh, great responses. Uh, so th thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your responses. And now let's move on to, uh, to our first slide, uh, which actually talks to us about what visual literacy can be described uh, as. And um, what we're really talking about when we're interpreting images is um, how a person can be visually literate. Hmm. So it actually means the ability to find meaning in imagery. And it involves a set of skills ranging from simple identifications, for example, naming what one can see, to complex interpretation on contextual, metaphoric, and philosophical levels. So from simple to complex interpretations. Many aspects of our mind, our cognitions are called upon, such as personal associations, questioning, speculating, analyzing, fact-finding, and categorizing, right? All these aspects of our mind are brought into play. Uh, objective understanding is the premise of much of this literacy, but 
subjective and affective aspects of knowing are equally important. So objective and subjective understanding and know, knowledge and interpretations are both important when it comes to um, analyzing images. Um, so the question, we're coming back to the same questions. Why do we use visuals in the classroom? Well, uh, it enhances students' critical thinking, right? Visuals, you show them an, an, an image, right? They start thinking in words. Students see a visual, an image, they start thinking, they wanna express themselves. Provide facts and information on topics of discussion. Infographics are great ways to, um, to enhance students' knowledge and already in lower levels of Spanish, uh, bring information to the table. Develop empathy and understanding toward other ways of living. Empathy, keyword here. Enhance comprehension of products, practices, and perspective, right? Uh, increase students' ability to negotiate meaning beyond one's own culture. So step outside of one's own world, one's own little sphere or bubble. <laughs> Foster the ability to make comparisons between beliefs, values, and practices. So key word here is making comparisons between your own beliefs, mm -hmm. values, and the other cultures, and negotiating them, being able to understand them, and as a way, becoming a citizen of the world. So that's uh, the goal, right? Uh, to be able to find work or live in a different culture or uh, be comfortable uh, talking to people and understand uh, getting your message across in a way that you want, want it to come across. Um, so uh, what I often employ in my classes is visual thinking strategy. Um, and visual thinking strategy, uh, strategy really involves two aspects. Uh, I've already mentioned simple identification, description of an image and complex interpretation of images. Um, so we see an image here, uh, Los Chukchidores, uh, which means the gleaners. Uh, it says this object um, is actually on view at the MoMA in New York City. And uh, looking at this image, uh, we can ask students, let's say in lower levels or even in higher levels of Spanish or language classes, what do you see in the picture? Okay, identify uh, figures, colors, um, what are people doing? How is the background? Uh, who can you see in the foreground, background? And how are people dressed, etc. So lots of things that we can use this image for, for basic language levels. And at the higher level, we can add on complex interpretation uh, type of questions. For example, where do you think these people are? What do you think they're doing? What does the title refer to? How does the artist depict the characters in the painting? So what, what qualities does, it give, does the artist give them? What emotional effect does the artist aim to conjure? So what the audience, again, there. And what do you know about the chukchidores? Okay, so the gleaners. And here at this point, I wanted to bring in um, another picture, another image, another artwork from a very different time period. Uh, the, the artwork is also called, called the gleaners, but I just want to point out how uh, looking at art changes over time and over centuries. This painting by Jean-Francois Millet is called The Gleaners as well, but is from 1857, so over a century ago uh, from the previous painting. And, um, and I just wanted to point out again, uh, how we view art and uh, what, um, what kind of context and images we value. Uh, so up until the 19th century, the dominant form of painting in France was academic art uh, promoted by the French Academy. Academic art was tightly regulated both as to theme and execution. During the 19th century, the system was challenged by an increasing number of painters, especially realist artists. Realist painting focused on modern issues such as social conditions, 
rural poverty and the lives of the common people, whereas the academic system did not consider such mundane subjects to be worthy of representation. So we see how from the French academic art, um, the, the theme, the, uh, the considerations, the, uh, the concerns of the people changed. And all of a sudden in this academic art, uh, the, the, the themes changed and, and involved or all of a sudden incorporated new social topics. Uh, so this is what we essentially would like to show you, uh, social, social issues um, that we use uh, art uh, and images. Uh, to bring about uh, an awareness and uh, understanding for students, for our, for our students uh, in the United States um, about uh, Latin American history and Latin American and, and Latinx concern, concerns basically here in the United States. Um, and for this end, I use, I employ in my art, in my uh, classes, um, in the artwork of Esther Hernandez, uh, who is from Dinuba, California. And uh, Esther Hernandez, uh, since the 1960s, she's been producing Chicana art um, and uh, as a way of a social protest, protest for political and social problems. And um, the Chicano art has also been important uh, with the Un uh, Union de Campesinos, the United Farm Workers Movement. And she, uh, primarily found inspiration from farm worker activists such as Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez. So those are uh, inspirations. And this is a great way of bringing in works by Esther Hernandez when students are reading about Dolores Huerta or Cesar Chavez, learning about the movement Union de Campesinos, um, learning about what their concerns were. And then you bring in uh, artwork, okay? As a way to complement what they just learned to reinforce the concept uh, of what they're learning with visuals, okay? Because visuals speak for themselves. And what we do here is we show students pictures uh, and with the, with the objective that we make students talk because uh, ultimately we want students to express themselves and um, we want uh, fluency uh, and proficiency in the language. And, uh, and, and this, these are great aids, uh, tools to achieve that. So taking the popular and well-known image of the sun-made raisins, right, on the left, uh, Hernandez transforms it to raise awareness to issues such as destructive impact of pesticides on the health of agricultural workers and the environment. And she attacks Sun Made in particular because the grapes that were harvested in her hometown were owned by that company. And Sun Made is the largest producer of dried fruits. Another one is Sun Raid by Esther Hernandez. And here she, with this painting uh, artwork, she uh, uh, draws attention uh, to uh, the uh, deportation of migrant workers. And in this print, we can see uh, imagery, uh, images of uh, sun made, right? But the skeleton is wearing an ice bracelet that is, conjures up images of, uh, of uh, Mexican women workers. Um, moving on, another artist I like to use uh, in my classes is Aliza Niesenbaum, uh, a Latinx um, artist who lives in New York City. And she, Aliza Niesenbaum, um, has started a project where she works with uh, undocumented immigrants, mostly from Mexico and Central America. And she uh, talks to them and, 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 and socializes with them and gets to know them on the personal level. And uh, when she paints them, she gives them recognition and dignity to give it to individuals who are often obliged to live in the shadows. So they show up in her paintings. And with this, her aim is to uh, give back, right? Uh, what they deserve. And here is one of the paintings, La Talaverita, uh, Sunday morning, New York Times. Uh, this was produced in 2016. 
and um, essential questions. This is a great artwork to talk about and have students produce language. What is going on in this picture? So it's very simple questions. What makes you say that? What more can we find? Okay, so have students look closely at the images, at the artwork, and, and talk about, you know, at the lower level, you can talk about colors, the figures, the position here, there, behind, in front, and at higher levels, more com complex interpretations. Uh, we have, again, women's uh, topics. Uh, this was for March 8th, International Women's Day. Uh, Aliza Niesenbaum uh, also paints and uh, about, uh, women and brings women to the forefront. Uh, and as such, it's a great way to use in our language classes to talk about issues of gender and gender uh, equity. And building a more inclusive art world begins uh, with recognizing the female artists who are already captivating our communities with dazzling and prov provocative work. And now with this, I give the word to my colleague, Asleen. Asleen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, well, I'm going to continue just sharing with you examples of artwork that I use for a second language level class. The language proficiency level of the student is a beginner's advanced, beginner's mid to begin, novice mid to novice advanced, and they're moving towards intermediate low. And uh, this is our work to promote social justice in the language classrooms using as a main topic, uh, the theme of uh, immigration. So why to use R in the language classroom? It helps us understand the past, the present, and empathize with stories different from our own. Cognitive linguistic Jeremy Lang argue that we use metaphors to make sense of the world, the world, but these metaphors are given to us by our own culture. So he challenged us to uh, be aware and to think about what are the metaphors or preconceptions that we have about images. Uh, when it comes to narrative related to immigration and when it comes to narrative related to um, the border, many we have a lot of preconceived negative ideas in our rhetoric and storytelling that have been limiting to our community. So by including these images in the language uh, classroom, the idea is to invite our students to think about social change and to aim for achieve in cultural perception. Uh, so these images also enhance critical thinking while supporting students in becoming citizens of the world. You, oh yeah. So it is interesting to show a map uh, of the border uh, and when students realize that there are two cities, two cities that are so close like El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, they can immediately begin to think like, oh, probably people go back and forth. Uh, probably people have families in both sides of the border. Probably people are always um, code switching between Spanish and English. And when students have a sense of the, the geographical location of this area, it is an invitation to pay attention not only to the news when the border is used as a political arena, but also to the voices of the people in the community and specifically to the artists that lived in this area, who are working in this area and who need um, amplification or whose work need amplifying. So these are some of the questions for the second language level Spanish that I use in the classroom. And we have the first uh, artwork uh, by Luz Angela Lizarazo Mudanza. Uh, this is a Colombian artist and this was made in 2008. The themes are migration, nationalism, identities, politics, market, societies, culture, inequality, and reception. So there is a migrant 
uh, in these bags um, that immigrants use to cross the border. It's a bag that is resistant, um, that you can easily move, and where you can carry uh, very simple things that you need to bring to the new country or where you are completing this um, journey. So there is a lot that you can analyze uh, based in this image. Some of the uh, questions are simple because students still can produce a, at a lower level uh, using the language, but they can say uh, what you see in this image. They can describe uh, colors and shapes, what figures or item do you see in this picture? Do you think they're realistic or not? What do they accomplish? And this is an interesting question because even with one word or a very simple phrase, they can express a lot of meaning. What do they do? Uh, what art medium it is. So they're using uh, the vocabulary that they learn for the um, art unit. And they're applying that vocabulary uh, while they're answering these questions. How does the image make you feel? What does it make you think? So we're also uh, studying the flip verbs at this point. So, me hace sentir, me hace pensar. So, it's not all, only gustar, but are verbs that behave like gustar and they use pronouns. And these are questions that are uh, created to give students an opportunity to use those, uh, that uh, grammatical um, structure. So, here we have another interesting mural. And this is actually a photograph of the mural and it's at the US-Mexican border in Texas. Of course, the imagery is very uh, powerful. You have the butterflies crossing the Rio Grande and it's a metaphor for transformation and for going towards another uh, place and you have the migrant, the worker, uh, that it's uh, a very well-known uh, image and it has its symbolism. And then the American dream with the Statue of Liberty and it's the dream that many uh, migrants want to achieve whether or not it's a realistic uh, dream or not. So we're expressing likes and dislikes and students with these images can say, I like it and they can add uh, more to those simple sentences. They can explain briefly or in a simple matter why or I'm interested in. So they're learning yet another uh, structure. It bothers me. So it's also a way of giving students the opportunity to use negative phrases or to learn to express opposites uh, or negative phrases. Uh, me too, me neither, I agree, I disagree. Um, we use um, these expressions often, eh, estoy de acuerdo o no estoy de acuerdo, and also we encourage our students to always ask follow-up questions or to share their reactions. So we're, when they're sharing their reactions or when they're doing their follow-up questions, they can say, oh, I agree or I disagree. Because the idea is to push students, even if they are at the beginning level of, um, of learning the language, to use as many phrases as possible to maintain a conversation or to keep the conversation going or to be engaged in a conversation with uh, one another, which is the expectation for a university student. Um, so to intensify gustar, oh, sorry, Victoria. <laughs> Good, yeah, so to intensify gustar and interesar, we use mucho. So me gusta mucho o me interesa mucho. And to intensify negation, we use nada. No me gusta nada or I don't like it at all. Mm -hmm. I can, can keep going, Victoria. Sorry, thank you. So these are images that you can actually find at the border. Uh, there are a lot of artists 
actively work at the uh, border as a form of activism and resistance. So this is a mural, uh, children played in front of a mural on the Mexican side of the border wall in Tijuana, Mexico. And the mural shows the faces of people that were deported from the United States. This is an old work, so it has uh, barcodes that activate first-person narrative on visitors' phones, believe it or not. Um, certain areas of the wall in, in Tijuana and El Paso are so, there have so many um, artwork that people actually go and visit the artwork. So this was created by Lisbeth de la Cruz Santana, which was a PhD student at the University of uh, California in Davis. And here we have a close up of that mural, that artwork. And I find it very powerful. Um, Many, you, you will see that many artists paint the wall in blue as a way of erasing the wall because the blue um, blends with the ocean and the sky in the background. So this is a powerful image because you see a close up of one of the migrants that was deported from the United States back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. So we have another artist that is also an activist and a feminist that have been uh, fighting for women's rights at the border because there is a lot of um, violence against women when uh, women are crossing the border. And Ana Teresa Fernandez began, began to erase the border fence that split up Mexico and the US in 2015. You still will find her and many volunteers working at the wall, painting over and over and over again, trying to erase the wall as a political uh, commentary. Here we have other images about this work and it is very interesting how from far away you can actually feel that the border is open or it has been erased and I think it is uh, very powerful. So she says this wall has become a symbol of pain, a symbol where we lament the life who have not been able to cross it. It's not erasing the border, it's pulling the sky down to us. And that also have uh, a lot of uh, connotations, especially when we think about um, the how religious the Mexican uh, people are. Mm -hmm. Here we have a more conceptual um, interpretation of what it means to pull the sky down to us. And this is Ale Carrillo Estrada, Borderless Sky. And it's um, it's actually in a gallery in El Paso. And it's uh, an interesting way of saying uh, there is no wall tall enough to actually erase the sky. There is no uh, border big enough to uh, cover the sky. So the sky will always be borderless. And you can imagine that students react a lot, um, very positive to this kind of artwork. But what's interesting is that it is so intriguing, so political, um, that students want to produce with the language because they want to share their point of view. And it's something that we want to do. Not only we're raising um, we're stimulating critical thinking and, and raising uh, cultural interconnectivity, but also students want to share what they're thinking, their reactions about this artwork using the flip verbs that they have learned and using the vocabulary that they have learned. Mm -hmm. So we also um, use activism in the US because as probably you all know, um, there is the DREAM Act and a lot of dreamers or young adults that came to the United States uh, undocumented because they were brought here by their parents. In many cases, they don't even speak the language of their country of origins and they feel that they are Americans, but they don't have the right um, 
to live in this country. So they're part of the uh, DACA uh, program or they're dreamers. And the DACA pro program, what it really means is that you can go to school and you can work for two years after you graduate and that's it. You really don't have any other benefits other than that, not being scared or chronically traumatized for two years because being an undocumented immigrant causes a lot of uh, intergenerational trauma, but also living with fear, constant fear, it uh, creates chronic trauma. Mm -hmm. So this is, an, this is a website. Um, I have it open in my browser, Victoria. I don't know if you want me to, if you want to open it. It takes a while to load because mm -hmm. uh, what Pablo and you can you can try it if it loads we can share yours. Oh, here here we go. Oh, that was very fast. Okay. Yes. Well, don't open don't open the mm -hmm. the faces because that's what it takes forever. But basically, okay. um, this is very powerful for students because you can create an activity such as establish a dialogue with one of these dreamers and you read the story of one of these dreamers and then you can ask questions students can form questions for these dreamers based on the stories of one of them and this creates a very interesting dialogue and in at, um, Boston University our students for the most part comes come from a lot of privilege. So it is very interesting um, for them to learn about the life of these dreamers that have had a, such a different upbringing than them. So again, it is a wonderful um, platform to have students produce in the target language because they do have questions and they do wanna establish this dialogue with these uh, young adults that are the same age of our students in many cases. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Victoria. We can go back to the um, mm -hmm. presentation. Okay. Now, uh, the images that Pablo Stanley create are very powerful, as you can see, and students usually have a lot to say about them. And they are somewhat popular, they've seen in, in social media, and they wanna learn more about them and they wanna share their perspectives. It is a great opportunity uh, also to talk about politics in, in a very simple way, but I always think that, oh, my students are going to be in positions of power in the future, and I want to make sure that at least they're well aware about these issues. So the Biden administration is considering reviving the practice of detaining migrant families who cross the border illegally. And this was in the New York Times in uh, March of this year, which is uh, very concerning because Family detention is the cause of generational harm, human rights abuse, and shame. So this is a good reminder that uh, racism is not limited limited to party lines. And um, you know, talking about politics in the classroom is not a hot topic. Uh, usually, students don't feel. Um, motivated to share their political perspective, but they do feel uh, strongly about sharing their views on um, on this guy, these kinds of issues. So they like to talk about human rights. They like to talk about racism, even though they don't identify, they don't like to identify themselves with a political party in public. Yes. OK. So this is an aerial view of a giant picnic at the border. This is a very well-known artist from France, uh, J.R., and he printed this tablecloth. This is a photograph of the eyes of a dreamer. And he printed this uh, tablecloth and decided to have this dinner where there are people from Mexico and people from the United States and the only thing that were able to go freely uh, across the border were tacos. And half of the van is playing in the Mexican side and half of the van is playing at the uh, United States uh, side. And we're not going to have time. I wanted to sh show a video about the artist meeting or or um, sharing uh, a drink with one of the eyes. 
uh, uh, guards. But um, 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 I would like to finish the presentation and probably we're not gonna have time. If we... mm -hmm. So this is another artwork that you find along the border. And this is, um, these are colorful coffins by Alberto Caros. It's an installation in Tijuana. And the idea is to denounce the death uh, register is year at the border coast caused by migration to the United States. So of course, this is to bring awareness of how dangerous it is this journey and the reasons or the causes of why so many people decide to, um, to live and to go to the United States. Because um, in many cases, uh, some of our students are not aware of the reasons. Sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a matter of a, life and death and this is why these people are deciding to leave their countries and and go to the united states but in many cases they don't make it because it's a very uh dangerous uh journey mm -hmm. so um these have been an interesting activity to talk about um the future. So the future tense would be uh the grammatical structure that I cover at this point. And it is interesting because in order for people uh, to create something new, it is important to visualize it, to see it, to think about, to think that it is possible. So there was a, a collective, a group of Mexican and US designers, architects, engineers, and builders that decided to send this to the administration of Donald Trump when he requested ideas for building the wall. So this is the utopian anti-wall. And um, the idea was to develop the world's first share co-nation, removing the existing physical border and creating a regenerative shared territory building a hyperloop transportation network and allowing free movement of anyone in North America. So very utop total utopian idea, but it is interesting just to see the visuals. Mm -hmm. Otra Nación, so visions of our society in the future. And again, I always think that my students are going to be in uh, positions of power. And it is interesting just to have um, this idea that things don't have to be the way they are, that we have the power to change them. So if we move to the next one, these are some of the questions. And again, this is second level Spanish. So they're describing and explaining uh, simple ideas and they're practicing the future tense by making predictions about the future and by using the present subjunctive. So what do you see in this image? Where and when? So this is always an interesting discussion because so many people think that this is a fantastic idea. And so many students think that this is absolutely impossible. And so uh, just by sharing the reasons why it is a fantastic idea or why it's not a fantastic idea, there is already Already a conversation in the target language. What do you think uh, the image represent? Will we have a border like this in the future? So I would like to go to the uh, last uh, Arte de la Resistencia. And here I'm just going to show you a lesson that the lesson that I use and how it is incorporated in the classroom for each class there is a website and this is the one for the class about images um, at the border or art at the border and I just want to go uh, through it so we have the warm-up they already have the uh, vocabulary they have the questions that I share with you during the presentation you can keep going yeah and then we have the first artwork. Uh, there is about the artwork. There is information about the artwork. And at the end of this um, 
website, we can keep going because this is just analyzing the artwork, describing and analyzing the artwork that's at the border. All of these um, pieces are at the border between Mexico and the United States. Here they have the uh, flip verbs. And I would like to finish the presentation with the trailer of the documentary El Mural de la Hermandad, which is by one of the um, um, if you if you press that arrow that is in the flip verbs, Victoria, mm -hmm. before playing before playing the mm -hmm. yeah wh when you go to the flip verbs, mm -hmm. there is a little uh, flechitas ahí. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, so here they uh, can watch the the trailer and then use the flip verbs to create uh, sentences such as, oh, uh, I'm interested in the artwork of Enrique Chu. I think it is very important to talk about uh, this uh, topic through the art at the border. Mm -hmm. So we can just watch the trailer. And again, si sí, estoy de acuerdo, no estoy de acuerdo, I agree, I disagree. So students have a lot of, um, uh, tools, linguistic tools to uh, express themselves while they're working with uh, the classmates. I'm having trouble listening to the music, but it's just music. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just wanted to show the lesson plan and then if students are interested, they can um, watch the documentary in YouTube. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for listening to our talk. Yeah, we can open the floor to uh, questions. We can do a q and if if you're interested. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was such an interesting presentation. Um, so let me see, it is 4.49, so we have about 11 minutes uh, for questions. I, I was, uh, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for this presentation. It makes me wanna go and create a lesson plan and start looking for art. Uh, <laughs> My question was, when you're working with beginner students, do they ever, how do you work with them when they feel perhaps um, limited in their language skills to convey thoughts? They they probably have more thoughts than they can actually express. Mm -hmm. um, how do you work with that with them and, you know, for them having the opportunity to express their thinking and their opinions and their feelings, but... Mm -hmm. The target language yeah well i can um i can show you so this is for second language spanish so students only have one semester of spanish when they take this class so 
it's build, building little by little, but they have they have the vocabulary and they have done some work at home with the vocabulary and also with uh, the flipper. So they have done, because we use the flip classroom um, uh, approach, students have learned, they have done a lot of activities with the grammar and also they had had the opportunity to learn the vocabulary and to see the vocabulary in context. And then I give them a lot of help, linguistic help. En la imagen hay, yo veo, me hace pensar sobre, me hace sentir, and I remind them that, you know, feelings are connected to emotions. And then they can answer all of these questions, which I think it's a lot of language that they have to use in order to answer all of these questions, but they can, and they have a conversation with their classmates and they can even report about, a mi me gusta, o yo veo, y ella ve. So it's, it's interesting, it's simple, uh, and there are short sentences, but still they're able to express a lot of what they want, um, even at this level. I don't know, Victoria, would you like to add something else? Yes, I agree. Providing um, a vocabulary list and anticipating what students um, would like to share. And then always there is the opportunity to ask questions, como se dice mm -hmm. in Espanol. Uh, we always um, uh, refer students to wordreference.com as well in the classroom. It's a great tool in addition to us as a resource. Um, and um, I always tell a beginner level students to start with basic uh, colors and figures. So that's already a lot of production that goes on before they reach the more complex interpretive questions. So they've already have a sense of accomplishment uh, with the language when they get to that more complex stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any more questions? We'd love to hear from your thoughts or any ideas. Uh, you know, just, just for, for everyone else to, to, to give them a minute, I, 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 I do have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, like, like sometimes uh, images can have different meanings, different connotations. Certain images can be acceptable in in a in a culture where in another culture you simply don't represent certain mm -hmm. things. Yes. Uh, someone at the beginning of the presentation, for example, someone was talking about the the symbols in in different cultures such as Japan or or the Western culture mm -hmm. to represent mm -hmm. different things, right? So how do you? I mean, do do you find this type of of differences often in in class? And and how do you how do you approach them? Do you do in, in this with this type of situations? That's a great question, uh, Jose. Uh, of course, uh, you're you're addressing the uh, the idea of the audience. Who do you present your your images, your arm, your the, the artwork to? And um, we usually start with um, um, I, I I am the coordinator for fourth semester Spanish, so it's it's uh, uh, we we cover social issues uh, often. So we present uh, students first with a reading about the social issues such as uh, um, Union de Campesinos, the uh, the uh, uh, the workers in California, uh, Dolores Huerta. And then we supplement these uh, ideas with, with artwork. So we already have uh, students thinking along certain lines um, and getting into the mindset of what it is like to work uh, or be in that type of situation, be in those type of families, um, activism. Uh, so we typically uh, have not really encountered those kind of issues that you're mentioning. Um, I don't know, Asleen, have you encountered any? Well, uh, not often, but I have to say mm -hmm. that BU is an international school and mm -hmm. there is training, there is training for 
uh, professors that have large bodies of Asian students in their classroom. And it has to do with exactly what you are saying. Um, you know, there are different meanings uh, for different things. And it is important for us to understand the audience and to understand who those students are and how to better serve them. Yes. But because of the um, continuity in the language classrooms in terms of uh, the content, I think students quickly understand how they can um, interact with the materials that it's offered by the department. And I wanna share one more thing um, just to elaborate on the uh, answer that I gave to uh, Cecilia, which is it is because I agree, it is very challenging to have students at the beginning levels to produce with the language and to have an, a class in art and have them really express what they want to express. But in another class that's also about art, the same unit, I also give them this. And so they have a lot of resources or linguistic tools to express in la foto, in la imagen hay. La imagen representa so, suposiciones y, opi y opiniones, tal vez, creo, distribución, primer plano, arriba, abajo, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. Y pueden, des para poder, des oh, sorry, to be able to describe. And the students actually complete an activity of vocabulary and an activity of grammar using this um, expression so that they, when they come to the language, classroom when they come to class this is not too far away for them they already have used it so they will know how to incorporate it but it's building little by little at home when they work in their homework and then also class materials and it's you know a lot of repetition of course <laughs> uh, i would like to ask everyone for a for a new round of, of applause for for our presenters thank you so much Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It's been a Thank pleasure you. sharing this presentation with all of you. Thank you for having us. Thank yes. you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much for having us. It was a pleasure.